Welcome to Blotsam. My name is Steve Waddingham. I'm a factory tour guide and also the company historian for Aston Martin. We're here today at Wickham Mill where from 1993 to 2003 we built DB7s in the factory just behind me. We're here almost 20 years to the day that I did my first ever factory tour with a customer at Blotsam. It's really like coming home again. Let's go and have a little look round and let me try and bring to life what the site is all about and how we built the cars here at Blotsam. If you were a customer coming to the factory to come and see your car or to order one, then you would eventually drive in off the road, park behind the reception just behind me, and then we would bring you over here into what we call the barn. Room for two or three cars to be displayed in there. We adapted the barn and we built a, a slightly raised wooden platform area with leather chairs and a big full wall display for colour and trim. So customers would come in here, walk through this beautiful courtyard and into the farmhouse. Obviously not what most people were expecting to find in terms of a car factory. And that's one of the, the biggest strengths of this plant was the fact that it was a beautiful, almost like a farm that grew cars really. Very, very simple compared to Gaydon really. It's a much smaller place, very intimate in a way. And the farmhouse just over here was literally old bedrooms split into offices. So depending on how high up the company were, depends on how many people you shared a room with. Over the years that we were here, some of the outer buildings around me were restored and put back into use. The training academy was just over here. It was a very simple training classroom with room for a DB7. The building right next to me became the reception area and also the finance office. OK, so we're now at the back of the farmhouse. You can see behind me the two big windows. The window over here would have been the sales director's office. This was actually the uh, CEO office. This was the office that uh, Ulrich Betts moved into. Um, prior to that, there was a smaller office, but with the way that the company was growing, he needed more room, uh, quite literally, to be able to work in. And that um, area over there was converted for him. There was a little sunken garden put in uh, to make it look a little bit better. This is really where things like DB9 were being planned at this point. So we're talking in the period of 2000 onwards, a lot of alterations started to be implemented here. And over the next couple of years, some of the outbuildings were converted. Previously, there were just derelicts, empty barns, and virtually everything on site was put back into use. And this was all in the build up to building Gaydon. So Gaydon was being planned, as was in 2000 and 2001, the Vanquish, which would be built at Newport Pagnall. So there's a lot of movement, people coming backwards and forwards between Newport Pagnall and Blotsam. Some of us would drive backwards and forwards to, to Newport Pagnall for meetings, and all of us would have our personal best time of getting from A to B. Many fond memories of, of driving that, that journey in a variety of cars. Also, this is where Top Gear and similar TV programs would come and film. So sometimes the pond behind me would be the backdrop for a DB7 to come gently up the driveway here on camera. So really walking around today is bringing back a lot of memories, not, not just from building cars, but also how we actually tried to sell the cars in those days. It was good old fashioned media really in terms of TV and even the TV programs were a different style to what they are today. So really walking around here is bringing back a lot of memories. Okay, so we're now with the, uh, the little pond behind me. Looking a bit more overgrown, and I don't remember the danger deep mud sign either, so it's obviously got a bit more kind of natural since we left. But that was one of the lovely things about working here. It was a beautiful place to arrive, first thing in the morning. At one point, I used to drive an hour to get here. I was commuting uh, for, for a number of months, for about an hour or so. And you come in in the morning, and there'd be little moorhens pattering across the, uh, the driveway in front of you, or rabbits even hopping around. So it was always a very, very nice place to, to turn up to in the morning, and often many hours were spent here going into the evening time. So it wasn't unusual to go back out to your car and find the little rabbit sort of cuddled up next to it. So a very, very lo lovely place to work. Okay, so we're now in the main courtyard. Again, you would recognise this from press photos. We are virtually stood in the actual spot where the DB7 Zagato was first photographed. I remember seeing the car here for the first time. OK, 
customers coming for a tour or a visit come through the reception area here, cross over the courtyard and then in through the doors behind me into the barn. And things were so simple back then, it was no more elaborate than just a couple of leather tub chairs outside Bob Dover's office with a colour trim box, if you've ever seen one of those, like a suitcase that opens up with colour and trim in. In the corner, a couple of up lighters. In the summertime, we had to be careful because um, bugs and creepy crawlies would fall into the up lighter and it'd become an, a kind of bug barbecue. So you'd sometimes be sitting there with the smell of a of a blue bottle being slowly cooked on top of a halogen lamp bulb. So it's funny how these things come back to me as I'm stood here looking at the, uh, the building. In terms of other things that happened here, photo shoots, ride and drive events where customers would come in, particularly with the DB7 Vantage, where we were trying to promote the cars. And uh, we would bring customers in and they would go out for a drive in a car and then go for a factory tour afterwards or before, depending on which uh, way round we were doing things. We always seem to be quite jammy with the weather. Whenever Aston Martin needed to do an event, for some reason, the sun always seemed to look down on us. So many, many happy memories of uh, occasions like that. So we're walking down the pathway now from the farmhouse where customers would have had coffee, etc., and then down towards the factory for the factory tour, if that's where they were going. Over here, we've got the old training academy. You can see the, uh, the side of the classroom there. On days where it looked like it was going to rain, or if it was raining, we'd have to carry a, a golf umbrella. If you have an umbrella in the boot of your car and it's burgundy and green, the same type of umbrella that we used to use here on days where it was raining. When we first moved here, this was actually the reception, but after the farmhouse area had been converted to that purpose, this would just simply be the way that we would enter into the uh, manufacturing area. Behind me, staff car park over here. And just behind the trees, which we'll show you in a moment, was the helicopter landing area. Quite amusing, really, that we actually had an area where we could land a chopper. Some of you may know Roger Bennington, and Roger would often fly his gazelle helicopter and land it just over there. And uh, for some reason, whenever anyone came in by helicopter, you could guarantee the weather wouldn't be particularly great. And I learned very quickly, don't stand underneath a wet tree especially when someone's cut the grass because you'll get covered in wet grass or leaves. We're now stood just inside the kind of gate area, although there isn't actually a gate here anymore. In front of me is what would have been the plot of uh, car park that had been converted for a porter cabin to stand on it. And we called it the DB Diner. And the DB Diner is where we were fed where we went and had our, our lunch and our breakfast as well, particularly on a Friday, big tradition, but all pile into the, the DB Diner for a fat boy breakfast. So chips and beans were order of the day for lunch. And on those breakfast occasions, it'd be bangers and, and bacon, etc., etc. And it was nothing more glamorous than a porter cabin, which was, a, I think, a, from memory, a step up from the original hot dog van that was here before we moved in, in the old Jaguar Sport days. The field behind me, sometimes you would see cows wandering past and I was once stood talking to a customer about the lever for the cars and he asked me how many cows it would take uh, to provide the lever and I said eight of them and right on cue, eight cows started to walk past me in the background and he turned around and he said, well I have those eight over there please. There's also just down here uh, a brook and the brook uh, runs from the water mill and back in the day obviously the water wheel would have turned, the water would have come flooding through. In our time initially the water was just uh, still and didn't move. We later on had the wheel restored and actually had it turning. Another funny little memory is we had a mink of all things living down here in the brook. Trust Aston Martin to have a mink living uh, in the brook. Anybody else would make do with a something a little bit more like a water rat, but we had to have a mink. And again, we once had a customer that offered to have a headlining made out of it if we could catch it. So uh, quite funny, uh, all these things come flooding back today as I'm walking around literally 20 years ago from the first time I walked in here with a customer. Okay, so we're now in the main courtyard area of the factory. Just in front of me is a roller door. That is where the cars drove out from. So when the cars were finished, they would drive out through that door. Down here, there would be rows of DB7s parked up 
with their backs to the, towards the metal fence here and those cars would be waiting to go back in to be finished. Finished cars, if they were outside, would just be parked up. We were only really building anything from about 12 cars a week up to about 26. So really that would average out just a few cars per day. So we could easily handle finished cars being moved outside prior to being loaded into a lorry. Many DB7s also drove through here, off on their road test. A road test was on the road in those days, not on a, on a circuit, actually out on the main road. I remember being here one Friday, a member from the club was out in the, uh, in the Ulster, the, the famous, uh, uh, known as the Club Ulster, now uh, looked after by the Aston Martin Heritage Trust. And the car drove in and we reversed it back through the door and actually put it on the end of the production line with a brand new DB7 behind it. But that door is where, if you have a DB7, it drove out of for the first time. Let's go and have a look down at the rest of the factory area. Okay, originally, the factory behind me, this is the factory or the end of it. This was the building that was put up by TWR, which was Jaguar Sport to build the XJ220. So when we first moved in, this is where the factory ended, right where that line is here. So if you have a six cylinder DB7, it was built in this part of the building. If you have a V12, and I'm guessing from about maybe 2000, 2001 onwards, it may have been partly built in the, the, the next part of the building uh, to my right. And we added this extension on. So prior to this being built here, the cars, when they got to the end of, well, midway through the end of the production line, really, they would have to drive out of the building, turn around in the courtyard and come back in again, which meant obviously going outside. So we added uh, the extra square footage onto the end of the existing building. And you can see now where the brick has matured differently and this is the later part of the building. Okay, the grey building behind me originally was the uh, stores where the parts that made the cars are made from came into. There was also a small paint shop here as well. And the original plan with DB7 was to actually have them painted by Rolls-Royce up in Crewe. And that was um, the way that all the six cylinder cars were painted. And then later on, we expanded the paint shop facility here and built another area at the top. The paint shop was added in later on in the life of the DB7 Vantage really so that we could have more capacity for painting whatever colours people wanted. So if I remember rightly, this opened in around about 2000. The paint shop was a state-of-the-art building for its time, but not like the one we have nowadays at Gaydon where we have robots. When the body shells came in from Coventry, they were delivered on a Jaguar lorry. Jaguar Transport would pick them up, move them from motor panels up to Bloxham, and they would be unloaded here and then the covered shed was where the body shells were then put into before they were taken in to, to start the paint process. Back in those days, all the cars were completely hand painted. They were sanded, they were painted, they were flattened and polished afterwards. So behind me, we have the back entrance from the paint shop. There's a roller door and the body shells, when they've been inspected, having been polished, they would have been put onto a, a four wheel, small wheeled, uh, trolley and they've been very carefully pushed slightly uphill and then down the ramp down into the back of the factory there's a roller door at the bottom of the building and that would be raised and the body shell would go in onto the first station of the production line well today there's a sign that says no parking the one sign i do remember being up here was no smoking and the reason for that is right underneath these manhole covers there's a petrol tank and just over here was a petrol pump and that's where we put the fuel into the cars. And on one occasion, I had a gentleman from Europe, I can't remember which country, and he was leaning against the petrol pump with a great big cigar on the go. 
And I said, well, you might want to put that out because we've actually got a petrol pump and you're leaning on it. So um, it's funny how these things come back. Uh, my memory being jogged by the sign on the fence there. The red brick building behind, again, if ever there was a way of illustrating how much things have changed at AML, one of the key areas would be engineering. And back in the day when we were here, the engineering department was about 20, 25 people. And that was the main development workshop. From memory, there was room for sort of three or four cars maybe. And there was uh, a loft area, which was actually a meeting room. Not a particularly inviting place to be first thing in the morning for a meeting. And it was just like being up in a loft. And we would sit there in, a, in this kind of upstairs loft area, meeting chaired by Bob Dover. And we would sit and go through every bit of the development of the, of the Vantage and where we'd got to. It's what we would call a gateway meeting in automotive development terms. It says Vantage Park here, and that is a name of the modern Wickham Mill plant. It's no longer a car plant. It's now an industrial estate effectively. Various other businesses are located here. So it's called Vantage Park, named in honour of the fact that it's where the DB7 Vantage was built. And back in 1998-99, Vantage was our top secret. Uh, the factory was closed to all visitors for about 12 months leading up to the launch of the DB7 Vantage. So there were no factory tours. And that is why in May 99, there was such a big backlog of factory tours to get through that I was drafted in. And rather than being an ad hoc process, I kind of unwittingly introduced the idea of a factory tour where you made an appointment and you came here and you chose your colour scheme for your car. And then of course, people wanted to come back and see them being made. Something we'd always done, but not really in a formal way. So for decades, people have come to see their car being made but it was always very much ad hoc, a bit like factory tours had been really. With the volumes being so low, demand for factory tours was, was quite low as well. So before 1999, people would just casually make an appointment or even just turn up and somebody from the office would show them around. And what I did was introduce a way of, of, of having almost a script, although I never had a script, uh, and we would have a, a sort of two hour factory tour with customers and people would come in and choose their colour scheme and also would want to come back and see the cars being made. Where I've stood now many, many times, I would have stood here and opened the, the door of a car to show somebody the interior. In those days, we could kind of walk around fairly freely around the plant and actually to see a, a number of cars, you would have to come out into the elements and look at the, the cars that were parked here. The cars were parked quite tightly together, so there was a chance of damage from the doors opening onto the other cars. So a little foam block was, um, with a, a self-adhesive pad was stuck onto the edges of the doors, and that meant that if a car door did open, the only thing that would hit the car next door would be the piece of foam. Uh, one problem was, of course, with birds flying overhead, there's always that chance that you might have something fall on the paintwork. So, a daily routine was to walk up along the line of cars with a bucket of water and a sponge and wash off anything that may have landed on the cars. Not ideal and it's something that thankfully over the years we've managed to get rid of. At Gaydon the cars never go outside and, be, and they're never parked outside unless they're covered over. So that um, prevents any damage to the paintwork. Another thing that happened here from 1998, the car that we now know as the Vanquish was first shown as Project Vantage. Uh, throughout the, uh, the process of developing that car, because of engineering being partly based here and partly in Newport Pagnell, there were bits of uh, VO3, as we codenamed the car, uh, coming in and out of the building behind me. And even some of the prototype mule cars were, were in there being worked on. So we had to be very careful when walking around with customers that we didn't stumble across uh, a Vanquish. And we developed a few good kind of tactics to distract people. Sometimes you couldn't help it, you'd be walking along and there'd be a car in front of you. You would just manage to kind of look away towards something else and distract somebody and then quickly move them away. And then quite often you'd be asked, is there a Vanquish anywhere? Oh no, of course not, we don't build them here. So there's a bit of cat and mouse really in that era. Of course, all of this was really before the internet was anything like it is today. There was no mobile phones with cameras. So it was relatively safe to walk around here. And if you did come across something that you shouldn't have done, we could kind of normally bluff our way out of it. So uh, 
looking into the factory as it used to be, obviously very, very different now. It's now a printing company. Um, Banbury Livo, the current to uh, occupy the main part of the building, they generously allowed us to, uh, to come in and film today. Uh, all the other units around us are all privately owned by different businesses and um, Banbury uh, Livo were, were very helpful in terms of giving us permission to allow us to film here, just walk around and do what we want for, uh, for a day. So thank you for that. You can see if we pan into the, with the camera there, we can kind of see that there really isn't a lot uh, inside the building that looks anything like it did when we were making cars in there. Well, I must admit, one thing I'm really quite shocked about today is to find the building behind me. I didn't really think this would be here, but this is actually the old water test. And every DB7 was water tested to make sure, in theory, that it didn't leak. And what that consisted of was the car driving into the wash bay behind me, where the doors are. There wouldn't have been any doors on there back in the day. And the car would drive in, and there were big pipes running all the way along the ceiling and around the walls and on the floor with jets that would force water all over the car from underneath and on top and from the sides. And it would take about five minutes. The car would almost disappear into like a mist of water. Unofficially, one or two people also went into the water test and it was often used for, uh, what should we say, um, sort of practical jokes, uh, we'll leave it at that. You can use your imagination. Only a couple of people, I think, probably went in there. But nonetheless, it was uh, certainly a way of getting anything that went in there very, very wet. The little lean-to on the, on the corner of the building is where the water tank would have been kept. Had a special chemical in there to prevent Legionnaire's disease from forming in the water. And it was thousands of litres per minute being pumped over and around the car. So obviously very different now. It looks like it's been converted into a storage area. Uh, there's a canoe, there's various other things in here. Interesting there's a canoe, because of course the water theme. Um, the floor's been concreted over. But back in the day, there would have been pipe work in here, uh, on the floor, um, over the, overhead, on the sides of the walls, water being pumped all over the car. Um, I seem to remember there always being wet tyre marks when, where the cars are driven in and out, uh, obviously while they were soaking wet. And the cars would have to be levered off uh, before the, uh, the water uh, sort of dried into spots on the car. The building here, from memory, is again another covered storage area where the cars would have been parked in here to cover them over. I seem to remember these were sort of partly finished cars, probably even painted body shells occasionally as well. The other bays here were for road tests um, seek and repair. Every car would have been road tested out on the, on the local roads around here. Uh, John was our road tester and rather unique individual in that he was a a qualified blue light driver for the fire service. He was a part-time fireman and also a mechanic. So really the ideal person to road test a car. Someone who could drive a car quickly and safely, but also listen for noises, uh, which is what road testing is all about, is listening for squeaks and rattles, mechanical noises, and obviously testing the, uh, the car on anything that's just been built really. You have to remember a car is built from thousands of components and at some point you've got to drive it and make sure that it works and do a kind of a shakedown. So every single car would have gone through that. And John and the team of mechanics would have been based in these buildings here. And that's where they would have uh, worked on the cars. I remember taking customers down to see their car down here. Maybe the car had been built and was at a certain stage and we would arrange for them to view it in one of the workshops. In my mind, I can remember showing an Antrim Blue Volante to a lady and gentleman from uh, London. And another memory I've got of being down here is actually uh, walking in one day and finding, rather unusually, a Jaguar XK150 saloon, which had been parked overnight. Very, very nice car. Oh, obviously, a, a late 50s green Jaguar, a little bit out of place on Aston Martin factory. And the car belonged to Jack Nasser. And Jack was the, the head of Ford back in those days. And he'd been over in Britain and uh, for whatever reason had stopped off here, left his car overnight. It's a real trip down memory lane. And I'm quite shocked actually at how much this all looks exactly as it did when we left back in 2003. A little bit of archeology span now, automotive archeology. span I love things like this. I love looking for little bits of evidence. And there's a little bit of evidence. An Aston Martin racing green colored uh, I guess a sign back in the day. Not quite sure what it would have had written on here, but it was obviously something that warranted a sign. 
and it's still on the wall. There's no wording on it, it's all faded away, but a little bit of Aston Martin racing green. And also, if you look at this bollard, uh, you can see traces of the, uh, the Aston Racing green uh, paint. It's amazing, really. I didn't really think I'd be talking about green paint today. Um, and in many ways, this symbolizes the way that the company transformed from being the sort of Aston Racing green, the green color scheme being symbolic with Aston Martin, and actually then going to black. And if you look at the new era cars and the, the way that our brochures appeared and dealerships appeared, we kind of so slowly moved away from the green onto the black and the silver. The green still plays a big part in my life in terms of what it means as an Aston Martin colour. It's the, uh, um, the centre part of the enamel on the badge for most of our cars with the, the green uh, bordering on the letters. So yeah, Aston Martin racing green uh, has played a big part in my life for the last 29 years. Uh, walking around here today is kind of bringing it all back a bit really. So really we're now getting towards the end of our visit to Wickham Mill and really it's bringing back a lot of memories of what it was like here, particularly towards the end. I have to remember that the company was changing yet again, the, the whole of our rebirths took place here. We'd gone from making two or three cars a week in the um, early 90s to a point where we would built 25, 26 cars a week here and we were suddenly into four figures in terms of annual production for the first time, over a thousand cars. That had never happened before. At the start of DB7, the company had only built around about 12,000 cars. And by the time we finished here, we were up to 20,000. And 7,000 of those were really uh, the DB7s that were made here. And gradually, the staff that occupied, particularly this building here and the farmhouse, were gradually being moved over to, to Gaydon. There was not really, in my memory, a particular day where we just turned the key, switched the lights off and, and walked out. It was much more gradual than that. So we're now at the home of uh, a friend and colleague of mine, John Muirhead, and we're going to meet John and we're going to talk a little bit more about how, how it was when the company first kind of reshaped and brought on Bloxham and how Wickham Mill fitted in with the Aston Martin Company really, and talk to John a bit more about some of the other memories of what it was like to be at Bloxham back in the DB7 era. Hey, hi hey, John. Steve, hi, how, how are you? Doing? All right. Nice to see you. When, when we joined, um, I think there was a little bit of a sort of them and us uh, situation because obviously they were the, you know, Newport Pagnell was the established workforce that had been there since 1955 and had, you know, built all those great cars um, and was in a, in a little bit way was sort of living on sort of former glories simply because the, the lack of investment had, um, had meant that uh, the numbers of cars being built were, had been reduced significantly. Uh, and the you know the profit in every car was 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 minimal. Uh, so when DB7 came along, it was a, you know it was this 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 new this new direction at a separate factory altogether, an hour away in in uh, Bloxham, um, with a, a team who had largely come from um, from Jaguar Sport, from TWR Jaguar Sport, who had um, been instrumental in developing from an engineering and a design standpoint that car. But I think as time went by and we moved from facility to facility, which, which again was a bit of a pain, having I mean, to travel an hour, an hour over to Newport Pagnon and vice versa, um, I think you know, we started to become much more integrated. And, and then of course, um, the move to Gaydon uh, was, uh, was the final sort of piece in the jigsaw, which uh, brought yeah. us all together. I guess all of us were out of our, out of our comfort zone when we went to Gaydon because it was new to all of us. It was Correct. all the same people, but yeah. new building. and. Yeah. And of course, Bloxham became the headquarters simply because um, you know there was um, a more modern facility. Yeah, yeah I remember uh, that there was more space, and it re really became the main the main, main headquarters, yeah. main, the main yeah, hub. That. You know, the factory was completely uh, refurbished inside in order to embrace mm. you know the, the jigs and the tooling for this new process, um, and um, and obviously that lasted until such time as um, it was no longer. I guess feasible to uh, to continue there, and the yeah. factory at Gaydon was uh, my met, being my built. Re my recollection is that DB7 and Vanquish sat quite nicely together. Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah. Rather than when DB7 and the V cars were were together, they they always seemed almost like two different companies 
And of course, the final version of DB7 were the Zagato cars. Um, yeah. 99 coupes, 99 DB AR1s <coughs> or DB American Roadsters, yeah. uh, which were built um, at uh, Boxham. Finished off at Gaydon. Finished off at Gaydon, that's correct, uh, because the transition was being made between the two. And um, all of those cars were, were sold, um, yeah. and now they are you know, highly collectible as any Aston Martin Zagato is. From a marketing point of view, um, most people watching the film will um, will have fallen in love with DB7, either when they bought it, fallen in love with it, or maybe they saw a picture of it, or they bought had a brochure at a motor show, uh, or they saw it on a TV program, whatever. And you know, for whatever reason, most people would have, you know, possibly um, seen some of the materials that you would have been responsible for. So, what was it like when you first joined in terms of what we did from a corporate identity and our way that we used to kind of promote things and how did that kind of change when it got it always felt to me as it got a bit more grown up we wanted to appeal to a more technically minded customer the, the traditional Aston Martins had a, um, a, a fairly rarefied customer base in that they were generally traditionalists they liked a, a handmade or hand-built car the DB7 we were trying to appeal to a younger audience, we were trying to bring the age range down uh, and to appeal to a more technically minded customer. Much more international, less kind of in, sort of in traditional English club, mm. which the old branding, the old CI uh, reflected, uh, to make it more international and also timeless. Aston Martin is timeless, the cars are timeless. Um, and um, you know, that design uh, that we implemented for. Uh, which, which you can see at Gaiden, which you can see in every Aston Martin showroom around the world, um, uh, was created in 1999, mm. um, and it was one of my one of my projects that, um, you know, as a as a train designer originally, um, I felt was uh, was was appropriate for uh, you know for a brand like Aston Martin moving forward, and in many ways it's changed very little uh, uh, since then, since 1999, which is what 20 years ago now. Yeah. There was a lot of. Um, change in the high street in terms of retail developments and also uh, dealership developments um, but we've never really had to make that I think we got it right first time and it and it sh and it's proved to be um, a, a timeless look and feel you must have had a few interesting people over the years that came in to see the factory for various reasons yes of course um, uh, Princess Diana opened the, 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 the facility in um, 1991 October 91. Uh, and of course that was a, a, a big deal, yeah. um, big occasion. Yeah. Um, she was in the area, I think, visiting schools and uh, uh, very graciously came and opened the factory at the same time. And of course we've had a long association with, uh, with uh, Prince Charles um, and uh, it, going right back to 1969, I think when he received as his 21st birthday present a DB6 Volante from the Queen. And I do remember once when uh, and Mr. Stewart announced himself at uh, reception, and uh, I was asked to go down. I didn't really think anything more about it. And of course, when I walked through the door, there was Rod the Mod, Rod Stewart, standing there in a, a long blue uh, coat. Um, and, um, you know, he um, proceeded to sort of introduce him to the, um, to the factory manager, who then showed him around the factory, and uh, off he went. Um, and then, of course, the, you know, the Bond connection, um, Sadly, it never extended to DB7. Mm. I remember there was a story that DB7, there was a drawing done for, for, for Bond, but because the BMW um, Z3 uh, was coming out, BMW jumped in and managed to, to get the uh, get the gig, and and we got relegated to the um, the DB5 being used in, in in the beginning of GoldenEye. But I think there was a rumour that. We've gone as far as to design or sketch out what a, what a DB7 yes, bomb car could yes. look like, but never actually suspect, happened, did it? I suspect BMW money, uh, money uh, talks. talked. And um, we got the Johnny English um, film instead. Oh, of DB7. Johnny English, yes, who could, who could, who could forget that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I remember meeting a, a guy who had bought a DB7 from us and went to the cinema to watch Johnny English, and his son tapped him on the shoulder and said, That looks like your car, Dad. And when you look closer, it was his car. Oh. And we'd, we'd forgotten to mention the fact that the car that he'd bought was actually the car that we'd loaned as the road car for Johnny English. And oh, he had really? changed the number plates. So, um, yeah, he got a bit of a shock, uh, I think, 
and a pleasant uh, shot, a very or... pleasant one. We oh, had to good. explain that the uh, the action scenes with the car hanging off the back of the uh, low loader wasn't actually his car. That was a fiberglass mule or whatever. But uh, yeah. but yeah, quite a funny one. But yeah, DB7, very photogenic car, wasn't it? Really good looking car. Lots well, of awards. Remember when it did. All those? It, it was uh, it was voted the most beautiful car in the world uh, at that time, yeah. 1993. Remember? I mean, yeah. it's a long time good looking ago. Good looking car and good looking now, but even more so probably mm. when it first came out. And in its final four, final four, you know, as the as the DB7 GT with the you know uh, for the final development of the the V12 engine uh, of that period. Mm. Um, you know, it's, you see one today, and they still look still look great. Yeah, it's, it's hard to believe it's 25 years ago this year, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. 25 years, quarter of a century, and yet the car looks as fresh today, really. Yeah, well, you see, ways. really good, really good designers um, understand about proportion and about mm. form and shape, um, and they apply that to to everything they do. And you know, um, um, Marek and his team are um, absolutely. Um, fulfill that to this day. Back then, Ian Callum with the DB7. You know, the car was great from every single angle. Didn't mm. matter where you where you were, low down, high up, three quarter rear, three quarter front, side view. It, it just ticked all the boxes. Mm. Um, and that's it. Doesn't happen by accident. You know, no. it's calculated. It's very carefully calculated. Um, and um, you know, it's it's something that um, is very much a an Aston Martin uh, signature. Um, to build beautiful cars. I mean, you know, that everything should be beautiful uh, about an Aston Martin. So that really kind of brings us to an end today of our little look round Blotsam, as we called it, Wickham Mill, as it's formerly known as. It really doesn't look a lot different in some ways, although the signage behind me on the main building has obviously changed and you can see the evidence of the, the units have been broken up into. So really blown away today by some of the things we've found. Uh, I didn't expect to find the water test facility that it still be there and if you have a DB7 I hope it's kind of brought it to life a little bit more in terms of where it was built, it's beautiful surroundings, birds twittering in the background. If you bought a brand new DB7 then thank you very much. You took part in saving the company basically. DB7 was really the car that saved the company in many many ways and without people buying it and without your support then we wouldn't be here making this video today. So thank you. Thanks for watching.